we present the 2023 Public Service Award for Contributions to Culture uh, to one of the greatest storytellers of our time, writer and director Christopher Nolan, for his film Oppenheimer. For Alonda. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a great honor for me. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with some wonderful scientists in my career, uh, starting with my friend Kip Thorne, who I'm sure some of you know. Um, Kip came up with the idea for Interstellar, worked with my brother for years, and then when I took over the project, uh, I sat with Kip, and I would have these sessions where he would patiently and calmly explain general relativity, things, simple things like that. <laughs> Uh, to me, and I remember after the first meeting with Kip, I, I called my brother, and uh, in talking about it, I said, this guy, he's great, I mean, this is amazing, um, and he said, yeah, but did you notice, after about 45 minutes, did your head start to feel warm? And I said, yeah, it actually did, and I never really thought about the idea that your brain could literally overheat having these concepts explained to you that, uh, for those of us who have not studied uh, higher mathematics, astrophysics, and all the rest for, for many years. Um, but over the time working with Kip, one of the things that we came to learn about each other um, was I started to learn that a scientist working at the level that, that Kip works at relies on intuition the same way an artist does. Um, I found that to be a revelation. And he found all kinds of parallels in the sort of intuitive screenwriting creative process uh, with what he and other scientists do in the world of physics. Uh, we found a lot of common ground. Um, it was a wonderful experience uh, and I've worked with him since on Tenet and, and then again on uh, uh, Oppenheimer. Um, and Oppenheimer is a film that, that deals with many things. Uh, but one, of the, one of the things it deals with is the interaction of scientists, the communication between scientists and the rest of the world. Um, and I think, you know, probably this would be talked about more tonight, but a lot of the time I think people discuss the role of scientists in policy making, the role of scientists in society as a whole, um, as if, if scientists would just sensible enough to simplify their message, people would understand it, uh, and everything would be great and the world would be fixed. And of course what that ignores is science isn't simple. Uh, it's very complicated, and what you deal with are very, very complex uh, problems and solutions. And for me, I would say intellectually and emotionally, having looked at these things from a lay person's perspective, having had the opportunity to talk to brilliant minds like Kip Thorne, like Robert Digraff, people like that, um, I come away realizing that of all the disciplines in the world and in history, of all the approaches to understanding our world and therefore being able to improve it, science is the only one, the only approach without agenda without politics. Uh, I don't mean the internal politics of different scientists. You know, I'm sure you all hate each other, really, whatever. <laughs> but what you respect is truth. Science is truth, and science seeks to disprove itself. It's proud to say when it's wrong, because that means something's been learned and something's been improved. And in case it hadn't occurred to you, or in case you're wondering, there's nobody else on Earth doing that but scientists. And that's precious and unique. And so when it comes to issues of dialogue around the communication of science um, and how that can help our world and how you know, here in Washington you're able to interact with policymakers, uh, I would make the plea, please don't sink to our level. <laughs> Keep on speaking the truth in the terms in which it needs to be expressed. And if there are complexities and contradictions within that truth, Please keep telling the truth and trust that we will find a way to listen and we will find a way to come to you. Because without that elevated discourse, without the truth being spoken, uh, all is lost. 
you know, in a, in a world where everybody is shouting all of the time, science risks losing its voice if it tries to shout as loudly as everybody else does. So trust us to find a way to, to listen to you and keep doing this wonderful thing that you're doing. Specifically with, with the FAS and the great history of this organization, I think it's worth pointing out, um, my film ends, well, I'm hoping you've all seen it. If you haven't, you've had plenty of time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but the, the film ends on a note of despair. And that's a dramatic choice because I'm trying to put the audience in the mind of an individual, an individual dealing with the things he's dealing with and show a thought process. And so I think it ends on a note of appropriate despair. But when you look at the work of the FAS, when you look at the work of so many people in this room, I'm not sure that despair is all we should be feeling on these issues. And that's a dramatic concern for a theatrical film. That's what I do. What you do is you ensure that there are you know, one-tenth the amount of nuclear warheads now, today, than there were at the height of nuclear proliferation. In other words, this is not a hopeless cause, whatever might film might imply. Uh, it's actually something that needs to be considered and worked at uh, continually and worried about continually. So I thank you all for the incredible work that you do. It's essential to the survival of our planet and all of us. And I thank you for this honor. Thank you very much.